Good morning. It's Thursday, July 9th, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 195. Wow, really? That's nuts. That's five away from 200. I know math. My name is Chris, and I know math. Aren't you proud of me? We have so much to cover today, so let's get right to it. Let me bring in our mumble room. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Hello. 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 Hello, hello, hello guys. Hey, so there Hi. is uh, much to discuss today, uh, and it's a great range. I like this when we get to sort of spread our wings and have a little bit to talk about from all sort of angles of popular topics. Let's start with Noah's favorite topic. Noah's not here today, but this one is for you, Noah, if you're listening. Google Glass Enterprise Edition rumors are swirling. It'll bring a new larger prism, an Intel Atom CPU, and an optional external battery pack. This is coming from 9to5Google. Stefan Hall over at 9to5Google has appears a rather nice scoop here. And uh, it says, according to several sources familiar with advanced prototypes of the device, the Enterprise Edition will have a larger prism display, which could include higher resolution screens. And I got, if you're watching the video version here, I got a little picture. On the left is the original Explorer Edition. And on the right is the newer Enterprise Edition. Now, it's not really clear yet what the actual resolution what has changed to, although rumors are the screen is better uh, than the one found on the Explorer Edition. Perhaps interestingly, in terms of battery, they've seen the Enterprise Edition device with a Google-made external battery pack. It's not clear how much battery pack this adds, how much battery power it adds, but it's likely that Google simply wants to offer an option to extend the life for clients with specific use cases. Now, the reason for that is... Overall, they say the battery life on Google Glass, not that improved. Slightly improved is the uh, verbiage that Google is using for Google Glass. Now, Noah tells me, you're doing pretty good if that thing lasts you four hours, and if you record video, you could burn through the battery before you're done recording the video. Um, they say one of the things that improves the battery life is the Intel Atom processor. In an, in a, in a, an Atom processor? In a device that small? Amazing. That would be really amazing. Now, adding a little more uh, smoke to this rumor is uh, last week, a device from Google by the name of A4R-GG1. Ooh. Uh, that was caught passing through the FCC. Now, it was just labeled as a Bluetooth device, but remember, that's one of the ways the glass communicates with your phone. It includes support for 802.11 A, B, G, N, C, and uh, AC Wi-Fi on both 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands. Now, we don't know much more than that, other than it's also been shown uh, by rumor, by people familiar with the matter, that the enterprise edition of Google Glass is going to have 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. So the fact that these rumors are all kind of coming together, a device just passed through the FCC with a chipset that would be matching the one in the Google Glass enterprise is starting to suggest Google Glass may have something for us, or at least for the enterprise, very soon. Uh, I wonder if that would mean the price is super high. That would make me think that's probably going to be a more expensive device. Anybody in the mumble room think that this is just a lost cause? I mean, because here's one thing that adds doubt, and I'll, then I'll toss it to you guys. Didn't we hear that Google Glass was essentially dead and they were going to roll it into the Nest division of Google and that then they would come out with something? This doesn't sound like a Nest product to me. No, it sounds so. like something that uh, a large corporation would want to use to have all their employees to have. That way they can do some additional monitoring of their employees. Mm. No. I don't think that's the reason. I uh, think about specific needs. Uh, a car inspector goes underneath the car. He does the inspection of the car. He uh, pretty much uses his eyes. This can give him, uh, give him advanced information on the inspection of the car. A doctor doing surgery helps a lot. And all of those fields do not require the legislative uh, uh, support that Google Explorer Glass requires, which is is it legal to film and take pictures all the time? Is it normal or awkward? You're within a company situation where expect there's some expectations of it's inside a private property. The the rights are there because the owners say that this is okay to use it inside of the company, and there has very specific use cases for very specific professions. And so this is what I feel that this product is targeting. This is also why they actually branched a couple of uh, units to specialized companies first to see the feedback and see how they could improve the devices for those, because those are the most likely ones to use. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the Explorer program, you know, there were some people that responded as creepy, the price was kind of high, it wasn't a huge hit, so, but they said, maybe they figure, well, this is a division where we think it has some potential. We'll double down on that. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Hmm. Especially in the medical field, especially in the medical field. Um, tell a, a surgery, uh, pretty much there is a doctor that is explaining another experienced doctor how yeah. to proceed the surgery. This is much better. It's much close to the, to, to actually the, the, the patient than if you're just doing it with a regular on the ceiling camera. Yeah, any other, anybody else in the mobile room want to chime in before we jump to the next story? Going once, 
Okay, going twice. All right, so let's talk about, uh, what do you think? Spotify, they play in dirty. They're giving uh, Apple users an incentive to stop paying through the Apple Store and pay uh, Spotify directly. Spotify is trying to wa- raise awareness around the fact that you can maybe save a little money if you subscribe from Spotify directly and cut Apple out. Uh, this has got to be a response, right, to Apple Music. Kind of, I don't know. Dirty play? Fair play? Anybody want to make a call in the mumble room? Fair play and it will... Fair play. Okay, one vote. Another. I just say it's it's additional competition. It'll give Apple or any other company like that a reason to lower their prices. Yeah, and it's good to remind people too that uh, there is a cost to doing subscriptions through the App Store. Um, I think uh, I think Apple is going to look for any reason to smack them down for this because <clears throat> I don't know. Like, so I, I is thirty percent a lot? Maybe. Yeah, maybe it is. I don't know. There is a certain value to having a payment processor that has a lot of credit cards on file that makes it one tap in the app that makes it very easy to do it. Where the and the reason why the Apple system, well, the reason why so many people do that is because people trust it. Um, Apple makes it really easy to go cancel something that you've bought a subscription for through the App Store. So that makes it more likely for you to be willing to get a subscription because you go to one spot and you tap a button and you're no longer paying. You don't have to call a number, you don't have to play a game, you don't have to unsubscribe from an email, any of that. You just tap a button. So it makes the risk lower, it makes people more inclined to try it. There is a value to that. But yeah. You think it'll still help Apple, Daredevil? Yes, it will actually help Apple, because Apple is being currently inspected by many antitrust authorities uh, all across the world. So, uh, yes, in true. the end, competitive measures will actually be good for them. Mm, interesting thought. Interesting thought. Anyone else? Uh, Kitson, go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering if something like this might lead to antitrust investigations in the U.S. because of uh, it just seems like they're starting to limit the ability of these third-party services to actually render their service at this point. Okay. Yeah, that's. it seems to be that Apple wants to have a major monopoly and control everything. <laughs> well, they definitely want to control the end-to-end experience, that is for sure. Uh, that is definitely their goal, I think. Let's talk about Microsoft. This has been a huge... So we didn't have a show yesterday, and a huge story broke. Huge story. Besides the stock market, <clears throat> they at least the New York Exchange uh, going down. Uh, Satya Nadella wrote out an email that uh, sort of shook things up at Microsoft. Uh, they had a huge amount of uh, layoffs that are, have been announced. They also are writing off uh, $7.6 billion related to its Windows Phone division, related, mostly related to the Nokia acquisition. And in, they also announced... Uh, that they're going to refocus. So let's retread on some of this. Uh, and, and as we go through this list, I want you to keep in mind that right now Windows Phone has a worldwide market share of 3%. So Nadella said that Microsoft was fundamentally restructuring its phone business. This includes impairment change, or I'm sorry, charge, impairment charge of approximately $7.6 billion in assets associated with the acquisition of Nokia devices services business last year, plus additional restructuring charge of approximately $750 to $850 million. So when you consider that Microsoft paid $7.2 billion, they paid $7.2 billion for Nokia. This is a total disaster. They're writing off seven point six, billion, and that's on their low end, because it could go up. They're writing off $7.6 billion, and they paid seven point. They are writing off more than what they paid for Nokia. This is a total disaster. This is why Bomber lost his job. They know they've known this is coming. You you don't you know a seven point six billion dollar write down is coming before it happens. They knew, and this is why Sache was rumored internally to also fight against the acquisition of Nokia, which is probably one of the reasons why he got the job. This has been on his plan. This has been on his plate. I bet since the beginning. Microsoft will no longer attempt to grow a standalone phone business either. Instead, it will create a vibrant Windows ecosystem that includes first party devices. Now, uh, here's how he explains it. In the near term, they're going to run a more effective phone, por- por- phone portfolio with better products and uh, to speed market... Uh, uh, there's so much crap in here. Sorry. Here's what they want. They're going to have three phones. They're going to have a, a, a cheap phone for like business customers with management and security and productivity. They're going to have uh, like the value phone that's also going to be cheap. And they're going to have like a flagship phone for Windows fans, quote-unquote, whoever that is. So Microsoft's going to go down to three phones... And they're not going to try to get into all the different markets, all the different lows. They're not going to try to have like a sub $100 phone, they say. Uh, Microsoft will make phones. Long-term Microsoft's mobile strategy is to push the mobi- mobi- mobility of experiences. 
So whatever that means. Huge change. Yeah, it, sounds, yeah, it sounds to me like Microsoft is trying to do whatever they can to raise themselves from the grave. Yeah, I mean, they're uh, trying to write a sinking ship, perhaps, or they're trying to realize, maybe they're also just trying to come to terms with this, just isn't something that's not going to work for them. I think it's a clear understanding that, okay, we acquired these, we needed some of the patents, some of the, because when we acquire a company, they're not just acquiring the manufacturing process. And there's IP that is valuable for Microsoft in there. Uh, they are, have a stronger foot when it comes to certain uh, access to drivers, access to this hardware that is new and vibrant. Um, pretty much, it's a way of making Windows capable of running many more devices and then bringing out a program that you know manufacturers like Samsung can put Microsoft on it. But I think this is a far-reaching goal. It's more like we can't just eliminate because that will look will make us look weak. But with a steady pace to let's go uh, back to what we're good at doing, which is software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, to that point, uh, a good guy Microsoft, they've made a significant financial donation to the OpenBSD Foundation. Microsoft has donated a considerable amount of money, uh, becoming its first ever gold-level contributor in the process. Uh, coming from the OpenBSD Journal, they say the OpenBSD Foundation is happy to announce that Microsoft has made a significant financial donation to the Foundation. This donation is in recognition of the role of the Foundation in supporting the OpenSSH project. The this donation makes Microsoft the first gold-level contributor to the OpenBSD Foundation's 2015 fundraising campaign. So how about that? So there you go. So they're focusing on, you know, and, uh, and right, they're including SSH in Windows 10, is it, or some, some well, their new Windows 10, or, I don't know. I, I know they're going to be u including SSH finally, so nice of them to include a contribution. This next story made me shake my head. What? Logitech is rebranding to Logi? Dropping the tech from its name. At least for some devices and products. I hate this. I'm sorry, Logitech. I like you. I hate this. The messaging around the change is coming so, sort of muddled, though. Uh, so, some outlets are reporting the company is actually changing its whole name, whereas the official press release continues to refer to the company as Logitech and merely states that Logi is just going to be a new label for like its latest product categories. Uh, Logitech says uh, that the Logi brand will be used for future facing stuff, and consumers will soon see it to appear in striking colors on Logitech products, especially in the Internet of Things category. <laughs> oh, Daredevil, what do you think about that logo? You liking it? That logo, I think they're backing up uh, Google studies that showed when they made the decision for the Google car, um, there was a study that they conducted that things that look like or resemble like a face uh, have better connection with customers. And this is why they have all that uh, facey look on the car. And that logo, if you look, is endorsing exactly those concepts. It has like yeah. that uh, Google vibe to it. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things that made them go for that decision. Logitech as a brand is not as much talked out there anymore. It's, it's true. Like, it's the go-to device, but you're not talking about the brand, so this will bring some news. And the third point is, yes, now there is a discussion. It's Logi or Luggy. Kitson, you you're excited about the colors, right? That's, that's exciting. Uh, yeah, I saw the new product line for uh, Logi and uh, oh, it's I called it Logi, not Logi. Oh, geez, it, it, it's definitely Logi. God, well, uh, but if it's from Logitech, uh, whatever. All right, that I'm is kind of cool. Looking at it and pronouncing it like it would be uh, a Latin-esque word, and I get Logi uh, when I saw it. But yeah, I like the colors. I like the new product designs. It's it's very vibrant, very. Uh, very uplifting in a way. It, it, they look like happy products. Huh. Okay. Whoa, here we go. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Go, Logi, go. Or Logi, go. For working. For playing. Experiences for you. So it's. They're adding colors, is what this is. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, there you go, everybody. That's and it gives uh, them, and it gives uh, more access to teams as well. Yeah. They more color things in general. 
All right, all right. Well, uh, now if that was if that was too kitty for you, if that colors and, and good feelings, let's let's get businessy. Let's get enterprise. Oracle has a new release of VirtualBox. VirtualBox 5.0 has been finally released. I actually wasn't quite sure what was going on with VirtualBox. Uh, here's a couple of things you might care about. Guest operating systems are now directly recognize USB 3.0 devices and operate at full 3.0 speeds. And uh, they've also improved support for bi-directional drag and drop between guests and host operating systems. And as long as you have the latest editions installed. And Oracle VirtualBox 5.0 has support for encrypted virtual disk images by leveraging AAS algorithms. And by the way, you can also set up a uh, uh, a uh, further security feature will ask for a password every time before you can st- before it'll start the virtual machine. Might be nice. And uh, there's also now support for starting virtual machines in the background with a se- separate front end uh, process. So when you uh, click the virtual machine, you can, now in the, and now you can normal start, or there'll be a headless start, and it'll start in the background, which is kind of neat. There's also uh, a high DPI support added for the Macintosh. Uh, encryption settings tabs has been updated, and actually, there's now an encryption settings tab. And user interface settings page for customizing status bar, menu bar, and guest content scaling have all been improved and changed and tweaked a little bit. VirtualBox 5.0, the full release has all kinds of news, uh, all kinds of stuff at their site, but they really break it out. The uh, improved CPU utilization, bi directional drag and drop support, USB 3.0, and para paravi- virtualization support for Windows and Linux guests. Um, it's probably my favorite feature. Those are the big ones they're drawing attention to. And uh, VirtualBox, still kicking. N- hey, VirtualBox, it's not VMware. There you go. Anybody have any other thoughts yeah. before we move? I like the idea of the headless start because often, because mm-hmm. a lot of times if you're doing that, you want to have a server running in the background, but you don't want to have this window open that you have to minimize. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. I. I. And uh, there's all. And now you don't have to use just the command line version to get that, which is kind of cool. Uh, all right. I want to give a mention, a plug for uh, Linux Unplugged 100, just because we hit episode 100 this week, and it was kind of a fun episode. We had some guests in studio, so we got to have them chat. And for a limited time, we're also doing a very small run of a t-shirt for Unplugged 100. That's at teespring.com slash LUP100, L-U-P-100. And we've got a couple different colors here. I'm digging these, like the bluish grays here. These are nice. And we've got a red, which is always eye-catching. And we also have a long sleeve shirt. You just go to teespring.com slash LUP100. It'll be available for 12 more days. We're not making a big stink about this one, because just to sort of uh, let those of you who follow the shows closely know as a thank you. And maybe if you attend our mumble room often and things like that, it'd be a great shirt for you as well. Teespring.com slash LUP100. And I, uh, I've got mine ordered. Not yet, I don't think, but I'm going to. I have 12 days. I'd have to ask the boss lady. She'd actually know. Speaking of the boss lady, she's going to be in studio tomorrow for Tech Talk Today, Friday edition. So join me tomorrow. You can be here in the mumble room. Go to jblive.tv, 9, 9 a.m., noon Eastern, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. And a forewarning, I'm right now planning to take next week off. I was considering doing it this week, and I didn't. Now I realize I should have. So uh, just for Tech Talk, I'll be uh, off next week for one run. And then when I come back, we'll get to 200. So I'll be back here tomorrow on Friday for 196 unless I lose a leg or something. And then on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week, I'm going to take a break, a breather, and uh, that's also going to be good because we're going to be doing some double recording, some of our shows, so I'll already be doing some double up, doubling up on shows. And then we'll be back the week following with, uh, we'll kick off with uh, the week that has 200 in it. So it'll be kind of confusing. I realize I, there's probably a way I could communicate that better. How about I put it in text? Hmm? JupiterBroadcasting.com slash calendar. Go there and get that in your local time zone. All right, so I'm going to leave us with another smartphone commercial. This one's the Motorola Droid Turbo commercial featuring James Franco, DeFranco or whatever his name is, and that's why I want to put this one in here. It's interesting. I've only listened to bits of it and pieces of it because I didn't want to spoil it for myself, so hopefully it's not horrible. (laughs) If it is, we'll just quietly move on, okay? And we won't speak of it again. See you back here for our Friday edition with Angela in studio. Thanks for joining me today. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. See you tomorrow. Really? It's not worth it. No worries. I got this. Oh! I got all the time in the world. Don't you want some of that? I got all the time in the world. It's a 2.7 gigahertz turbo processor. Kevlar fiber durability. Turbo charge for up to eight hours of battery in just 15 minutes.
Introducing Droid Turbo by Motorola.